He gave a smile, an odd smile, especially for having his own gun crammed into his own eye socket. The smile looked genuine, but oddly it was not the unnerving, psychotic sort of smile. He just seemed like some pony she had bumped into at the market, and he was apologizing for the trouble. The whole scenario seemed so very odd. Even Logical Lexi was stuck shouting out guesses and then countering herself. But all in all, her brain was just blazing in an inferno of confusion as to why this specific pony was here. He's from the shop. He's the pony who wanted to buy my book, Lexi said, nearly stumbling and falling forward as she popped out of the harness fully. Yeah, I know. He's been following us ever since we left Patternsville. Oso's grip tightened as just a hair, making the unicorn wheeze, but he refused to stop smiling. Hey, I had to. The fine lass has something that belongs to me. I offered to give her a bloody lot for it. He chuckled, and Kroos drew back the hammer of the revolver. It's not yours. You followed us all across Equestria for nothing. I hope it was worth it. Osa's eyes narrowed and his talons tensed. Oi! Wait! You don't be wanting to do that, boyo. He squirmed uncomfortably, clearly having trouble breathing under the iron-like grip of Oso's impossibly strong talons. Okay. I guess I can just shoot you instead of the turkey crushing you. Kroos's talons tensed on the trigger, but Alexi popped up with some urgency. Wait, do we really have to kill him? Do we? She squirmed, knowing the pain and pressure those talons could exert. She was also caught up in not wanting to see the unicorn dead. Additionally, her own curiosity on his claims tugged on her mind tantalizingly. Lexi, I know you're still not used to this, but you can't be soft in the wasteland. Oso grumbled, suddenly a little uncomfortable, killing the pony in front of her. Can we please just hear him out? She looked at both of her griffin friends, who looked over at each other. Crow shrugged. Sure, we can drop him from a cloud level afterwards. Alexi flinched and chewed on her lip. But a touch of ease flowed through her when Oso sighed loudly and loosened his grip. But... He clearly wasn't ready to let the stallion go. Coughing, his smile remained. It even brightened a bit when Kroos, feeling the group's choice, pulled back and took the gun out of his face. The unicorn breathed a little easier before clearing his throat. Thanks, love. As I was saying, the book, it's mine. Kinda a long story. It would have had to have been. It's been locked in my library for 170 years. Lexi sat, making eye contact with the pony, uh, shifting as best she could within Oso's grip. Indeed, uh, it's a, a wee bit of a difficult thing to explain, a bit more or less, lass. Uh, supposed to inherit it. I'm directly descendant from the author, and was supposed to get the bloody thing back from the ministries. He grumbled, his smile fading a touch. But family never got it back due to, you know, the world ending and all that. Lexi hummed. She had bought it. The book had not been borrowed from the Ministry of Wartime Technology, but it was not impossible that it had been misplaced or stolen from the MOT, only to end up in the shop where she bought it. Such theft was far from unheard of. Come now. It's not all that big of a deal. I don't even uh, need to own it. I just wanted to read it for long enough. He smiled, looking at her with a sly, almost suggestive grin, which faded when Oso gilded his face between them. You still surprisingly successfully stalked us, proving quite the security risk, and you didn't take the hint every damned time I tried to scare you off. Oso's talons tightened just a little, causing him to grunt uncomfortably. But Lexi's mind churned. If he had been following them the whole time, it meant he went up north, which was where she'd first found him. 
But the way Elsa was talking, he knew that they were being followed. This made more sense, and she could hear the Lexies bringing up several times that Oso had been doing odd things or staring off into the distance behind them at the path they had just come up. But why hadn't he said anything? That was another question. The big thing dominating her mind at the moment was that this was the Wasteland. Kroos was willing to snap the scribe Scribble's neck for the mere possibility of her having a key. Clearly the world had gone to... A very shoot-first-at-questions-later culture. But this pony had been following them. Even helped defend her when she was in danger. She breathed in deep and asked a single, simple question. Why didn't you kill me? He looked at her and frowned. Love, I'm not that kind of pony. Sure, I don't have any problems with lifting the book off you when you're busy or sleeping. But I'm not in the business of often poor, naive little asses who can barely fend for themselves. Lexi had always been intelligent, but the unicorn was right. She was naive. She was desperate to find ponies to trust. She was certainly cautious, since she woke up in the stable, which felt like years ago. But here and now, looking this pony in the eyes, she couldn't help it. Can... can we let him go? Oh, so frowned, and Crows laughed. But much to Kroos's sudden disapproval, also turned back to the pony and spoke firmly. How did you get past the wolves? The shopkeeper chuckled, shaking his head. Do I look that stupid to you? I didn't set one foot and a hoof into their territory. I waited for you to come back to the cave. But I came running when I heard some shouts. Almost like the bloody thing. But the lovely lass kicked me right in the togger. Can't blame her after what she I saved from, but backed off and I waited. And the green. Also tightened the grip around the pony. Can't say I know what you're talking about. He grunted, nervously trying to shift under the pressure. But I gather you're talking about where I lost your trail. All I know is ye went ahead, and after I checked around the corner, ye were gone. Then a bloody enclave patrol came in. I dug in and waited, but you didn't come back. I had to pick up your trail when you came back out, but that grizzled old bird... <laughs> I found him first. They learned pretty quick, like, that I didn't want to follow him. But I found ye are shortly after that. Also tightened his grip just a bit more as he breathed in deep, and with a little more aggressive tone than Lexi thought he had in him, he growled one last question. And how exactly did you follow us? He laughed and shook his head. I ain't telling ye that until I have your honest to holy word that ye won't kill me. And trust me, mate, you're gonna want to know. You're really gonna want to know. He also glared and very clearly tightened his grip. Lexi stood and raised a hoof in concern, only to be met with the enormous palm of Oso. Unicorn's smile faded into a grit-toothed, pained expression as he struggled to breathe. Are you certain you want to risk my temperament? Nearly changing colors and gasping for air, being forced, struggling to breathe for him, the pony wheezed. Are, are you really certain you don't want to risk knowing? And with those words, the pony clamped his mouth shut, glaring Oso in the eyes. Both stared firmly and slowly. Elsa's crushing grip tightened more and more, but the pony refused to say a word, even as his eyes began to involuntarily wander as consciousness began to fade. Lexi was on the verge of trying to futively push and pull on Oso to free the pony, but she knew it would be beyond useless, but she was nearly desperate at this moment. She honestly did not want to see him die. Batting her lip, Lexi finally clenched her eyes shut and turned away. So that very certain that Oso was just about to finish the unicorn. There was a sound of hooves on the ground and a loud, desperate gasping. Lexi's eyes opened, and Oso stood over the pony, pushing him back onto his back. Very well. As much as I dislike this, you have my word. I won't kill you for this. I trade your life for the information. Gasping, his chest heaving, the pony tried to roll upright but also kept him from doing so. Eventually, he simply lay back and caught his breath. I'm 
not technically following you lot. Panting, his eyes never lost Oso, who cocked his head as if reconsidering sparing him. After you left my shop, I scrambled, trying to put together supplies and follow ye. But some pony elves came up and started asking questions. <clears throat> they, they asked about ye three specifically. Dropped plenty of caps on my counter. I told him only what ye looked like and what ye brought. He seemed right pissed off. <clears throat> he left in a hurry, but he made quite a mistake. The tosser whipped up one of them fancy invisibility cloaks, and he turned the corner. But his cloak set off one of my devices, you see. <clears throat> I got lots of little doodads left over from me pop. One of them monitored sub-variants of radiation. <clears throat> I think his cloak had been damaged. My little sensor picked up his cloak for miles. I figured he's following you lot. I'll follow him. And I get the chance to nab my book. No pony gets hurt. Also narrowed his eyes. A very clear look of concern crept across his features. But he stepped back and the unicorn put his hooves under him. Crows seemed a bit angry. But he was at least a little used to the fact that he didn't get to make all the decisions. Also narrowed his eyes on the unicorn and he spoke calmly. In an invisibility cloak as if his ribs were still adjusting after nearly being crushed he breathed slow deep breaths but he looked up and nodded Oso in turn grumbled well I guess Tyron wasn't pissed off enough already what is it? Kroos looked over at the big griffin a curiosity perked when Tyron was mentioned he's not a fan of invisibility Oso shook his head he doesn't care about tech or magic. He just cares about who makes the stuff. Lexi blinked, and the thought hitter, all was rather well known, and talked about the subject in some of the larger group projects. He's worried about zebras? Also glanced over with an odd look, as if he were to shake his head and explain to her her night. Avity. No. He hates them, almost more than anything. This time, Kroos was a little more interested. Oh, there's gotta be a story there. What did they do to piss off the old perpetually pissed off bird? Osa's only answer was shaking his head and turning back towards the unicorn. Do you have a name? Lexi allowed out a breath she wasn't aware she was holding. If Oso wanted his name, it was unlikely he would just kill him. Clearly, by the way the unicorn smiled, he believed this too was the case, and responded firmly. The name's Fob Watch. Pledger and all of that. Again, Oso looked over him as he spoke calmly. How much do you know about what we were up to? An odd smile spread over Fob Watch's face. Well, you're heading right towards the ghoulies up that way, and you've got lots of tech, so I'd wager you have business with them. And you're in luck, lad. I can help you lot right out, right fast. I've got me a little bit of doodads that I don't need, and I can add to your pile if you at least let me read the book. Don't need them. I just need to read the thing a little I'd wager it's almost a guarantee that you'd be let in with a wee bit of me charm and goodies. There was an odd grumble in Oso's throat, as if he would prefer to kill Fobwatch, but instead was willing to put up with him. Talk to Lexicon about the book. If you can win her over, then sure, but you're not getting your gun back until you leave. If you're out of the group, we will kill you on sight if we see you again outside of your shop. Consider this your short leash. If Lexi is hurt for any reason, we will kill you. If we think at any time you are putting us, our goals, or lexicon in danger, we will kill you. If you piss off Tyron even by existing too close to him, he will kill you. Any further involvement with the group will depend very closely on whether or not our members Feel that we can trust you. 
It's entirely possible that Tyron will just kill you for safety's sake. So, make your choice now. Leave, or stay. Bob Watch didn't even pause. He just smiled and looked to Lexi. Well, lass, my help for a chance to read a good book. Lexi oddly, finding it hard to look him in the eyes, nodded with a shaky smile, and also turned to the road as a grumpy crow fluttered in place over and behind the unicorn. The trip was rather uneventful, mostly just a few moments when gunshots would go off in the distance and then nothing. Only once did Oso have to go and scare off a few desperate scavengers. But here and there, in the full might and beauty of possibly the most intact building Lexi had seen after the war, the rebar reinforced concrete and the vague signs of slightly faded magical wards, the whole structure still looked brand new. Only a little spot had been taken a torch of damage and looked to be suffering a repair talisman malfunction, showing off a very few gashes in the concrete and revealing the thick rebar beneath. Even the door looked like it was made of flawlessly polished material and tempered steel. It was all very refreshing and impressive, almost inviting, until it was a voice that started to pop up. You're not allowed here, bird. We made that clear last time. The voice was prim and proper. Old-fashioned canterlot, as Lexi knew it. But something about it sounded very wrong. It sounded much more like an alien or a monster trying to imitate an old-fashioned canterlot tone. Waspy and wheezing. If Pony Flesh was capable of rusting, she imagined this is what a fancy Canterlot noble would sound like after their throats suffered a hundred years of rust. Yeah, that's kind of why we're here. To patch things up. Also calmly gestured to the box Lexi pulled aside. But, all at once, two very large turrets unfolded from the building and leveled it also. Very, very large turrets. Weapons that looked like nobles bought them had, after being spooked and went into iron shod firearms and asked for the biggest, scariest things they could create. You aren't welcome here, bird. Also sighed. Please, don't make me break your guns. We just want to talk. To make up for the problems in the past. And to make sure they remain in the past. There was some sort of uproar in the background, barely caught, as whoever was pushing the button to talk had caught a tiny amount of the feedback. I'd like to see you try, bird. These puppies can turn a whole pack of hellhounds into a fine red mist at 200 yards. They fire so fast that you can't even... Oso reached out, grasping both of the turrets as he tore out a piece at the base, and both went limp. Please, let's just talk. There was a moment of silence before a very, very angry voice just garbled into the microphone. Lexi was certain it was supposed to be words, but she hadn't heard nobles in Canterlot get that angry before. She didn't feel very good about the mission so far. Under the flinching, twinch, twitching, and over-eager watch of Kroos, Bob Watch moved forward and cleared his throat. <clears throat> let's see here, lads. L12 series power crystals. Might need a little charge, but easy to reinforce power issues your repair talisman is having on the south side, and no doubt any other issues deeper in. Flash industry shield lenses. No labels, but I'm positive they look to be at least from the Series 5 heavy shields. Armored power actuators for your turrets, so big birds can't just tear them out like that. Oh goodness, there's a lot of good stuff in this box. Sure, some of it needs a wee bit of work, but surely some fine civilized folks with minds great enough to hold a fine pre-war building like this would be civilized enough to at least speak face to face with some pony willing to give this much, just to patch up the rocky relationship. His accent wasn't completely covered, but it was clear that 
Being a shop pony left Fobwatch with just enough conversational abilities to smooth over at least some problems. Oso looked a little annoyed that Fobwatch had spoken up, but his eyes held some hope at the odd silence from the speakerphone. They were left in silence until some raspy, sandpapery voice said, uh, Tyron isn't here, right? No, we made specifically sure to leave him behind. I also looked a little nervous, even looking behind him as to, to make sure that the old gray bird wasn't sneaking up on them. Again, there was some silence before the doors loudly clacked and an inside door rumbled open. Come in then, but don't expect everything to be just fine. Goodness gracious, what did Tyron do? Lexi was almost uncomfortable asking, as she too looked over her shoulder to make sure the old griffin wasn't there. Don't ask. Oso shook his head and they moved inside. As they entered, more turrets whirled and clicked, tracking their movements through the long hallway. Lexi nearly had to bite her tongue as she spotted a shriveled up husk of a dark pony with grotesque protrusions from his back that gripped at the machinery he worked on. He only gave them a passing glance, and it took Lexi a moment, but she came to the conclusion that she was looking at what used to be a bat pony of some sort. A leathery membrane of its wings had simply been removed, leaving long, frightening limbs that looked like they belonged in her darkest nightmares. Wordlessly, Oso led them past the various displays of half-constructed works before they entered a much larger room, and a voice came out, almost as if it were some dark and ominous creature, but the unicorn who strode forward was a bright pink, despite the missing patches of mane and severe damage to his undead flesh. The ghoul smiled as he spoke. You've brought some newbies. Oso looked left and right before nodding. The gray one is just coincidentally with us. If he breaks your rules, you're free to punish him in any way that you'd like. He also gave Fobwatch a soft glance, and the unicorn shrugged. I see. Well, then, fillies and gentle colts, welcome to the Dependable Equestrian Reclamation Project. The ghoul stood tall and proud as he gestured to the many other ghouls, almost all exclusively unicorns who spread over the room. Most at work, and very few uh, turning to acknowledge their guests. Lexi blinked. Derp? You named your group Derp? The unicorn paused for a moment before whipping around and throwing a glass at a small table at another ghoul. Damn it, sandbox! You said that no pony would notice. I said no pony would care. The other ghoul grumbled and scooted back. Our goal is more important than a name. If we succeed, or even make progress, literally any progress at all, no pony in this world or the next will care how odd the name is. Goal? Both Lexi and Fobwatch spoke in unison. The unicorn ghoul glanced at them, then back at Oso. Do they know? Oso shook his head. Not yet. And as much as we can agree, Tyron is a bit of a hindrance to the plan with his stubbornness. He is adamant that they don't know unless it's absolutely necessary. Lexi blinked. She was so certain that she was so very close to being told. For something she knew so little about, the little project was horribly tantalizing to her. She felt a little betrayed in that her mere existence seemed to be more than enough for the old griffin to deny her the knowledge, especially since the wolves only agreed to help because of her. But then the possibility tickled her senses. Perhaps he was guarding his plans. The griffins had been some odds to some degree with both the ghouls and the wolves. Possibly a problem exclusive to the stubborn and very angry tyrant. Maybe the troubles brewing between them was easier to hide smaller details in. Well, as physically painful as it is, for now I agree. The ghoul looked to shudder very clearly, 
painting how much he did not like Tyron. Well, I suppose we can speak. Sandbox can see what you have to offer. Just keep your ponies away from anything important. The ghoul glared at Lexi and Fobwatch, but looked to Kroos as if he hadn't noticed him before. He looked like he was going to say something, but just shook his head and gestured for Oso to follow him up the catwalks and further into their little headquarters. So, what's derp exactly? Lexi's words were rather quiet, adopting her old work tone. Back in the Ministry of Technology, most ponies were always busy working and glared at you if you uttered a single word louder than a whisper. This place seemed to be similar, despite the living dead tapping around on computers and monitoring systems, it felt oddly similar, almost safe. The pony from before, Sandbox, tuned with a surprisingly happy smile, but it was not him who answered. Old Ghoulies left over from the ministries, working on trying to preserve old Equestria and probably doing some secretive stuff such to make Equestria a thing again. Fobwatch mumbled the information almost as if he wasn't paying attention. Sandblocks blinked and nodded. Well, yes, how did you know? Fobwatch smiled and shrugged. Ponies remember things, and ye lads didn't always exclusively bring ghouls into your little group. I have met more than my fair share of ponies who recall invitations into your group. And while it's rare, your group does have those who leave it. Ponies talk, even ghouls who are part of the semi-secret group. Sandbox grimaced and looked back to the box of salvage. It's just odd that you know so much and have so such knowledge readily available. Fobwatch helped him pop open the lid of a container and start sorting through the gear. It's nothing, really. I'm just aware of groups around, and I got myself a good memory. I'm just a good pony to ask, that's all. Plus, the name kind of gives it away, even if you didn't already know. I mean, hell, try as you might, but Equestrian Reclamation Project can't be much else. They pushed through the gear and cataloged the salvage. There was very little conversation. Lexi was simply enjoying the aura of the place. The soft sound of silent ponies going about their daily work. It was like taking a bath for the first time in ages. A workspace for the intellectual and cultured, even if they were all undead monsters. Lexi nearly whimpered and quickly slid the hood of her helmet down when she closed the distance and caught the eye of a few of the local ghouls. She'd come a long way from the screaming, wetting herself, and passing out from whenever she saw her first ghoul back in her old apartments but they still drove a cold shock down her spine. At least the talkative sandbox seemed rather easy to endure, even if he, like all ghouls, was hard to look at. But the way he looked over each item, the way he smiled as he went about his business, she felt an odd warmth just watching over him. She had spent the pa best years of her life uh, learning from professors just like him. Excuse me. She raised a hoof. Watching her volume, but happily, she only gained the attention of Sandbox. She struggled, looking into the decaying face, but she took relative comfort in the kind open eyes. You're from one of the ministries? He smiled, and to her comfort, the image didn't haunt her. Ah, yes, I was in the Ministry of Morale. He beamed rather happily, but almost instantly, Lexi's reaction was a little more than noticeable. What? Lexi forced a smile, but couldn't help the dread in her heart. She was pretty certain he wasn't one of the Ministry Mayor's enforcers or agents, and even if he was, which she highly doubted due to the way he poured over the parts and spoke back and forth with Fobwatch, and even if he was, they were way out of business for the past 170 years. But the number of times Lexi felt like she was just one stuttering misspoken word from being thrown out in the friendship dungeon, or simply being disappeared during an interview with any member of the MOM was beyond counting. A sudden new voice erupted in her mind. She didn't quite know what to call it, but it appeared to be birthed from her logical and cautious sides. He doesn't know how old you are, 
He doesn't even know who you are. Keep it that way. Eh, it's a vulnerable ace in the hole. She shook herself and cleared her throat. I've, um, read some journals. Scary stuff from the Ministry of Morale. Sorry. I just kind of get spooked. I have a very vivid imagination. She sheepishly rubbed her hooves together, trying to find a way to ask questions without revealing her past. She didn't mind telling the story, but watching the Griffins, she was starting to understand the value in not giving her life story to every stranger she met. Sandbox laughed. It wasn't malicious or mocking. It seemed genuinely amused. His old eyes showed an equally old and kind soul, despite his decaying body. I'm an engineer, chief researcher for the Ministry of Morale's branch in Salt Cube City. I was not one of Pinky's spooks. This did a lot to calm her nerves. It was a little intimidating to spend time with some pony who outranked her by so much, but appeared to be on the much more relieving birthdays, music, and entertainment side of the MOM. Ah, so you probably did a lot of work on those pre-wartime projects? She paused as her new Lexi glared at her, and she quickly added, The journals and books say a lot about that stuff. Ah, yes, certainly. I was working on the Friend Force One and most of its incarnations. He happily picked up a small piece of the equipment they had brought in and looked it all over before setting it to the side. Well, as much as I love a little chat, I think we got it all cataloged and I'm actually kind of impressed. I really hope we can work things out. I could really use this stuff to fix a lot of the stuff around here, and when the project is finished, I can bring a lot of this back to where it will be even more needed. Home in the Dome. Salt Cube City still... Lexa cleared her throat, remembering the whole bit about hiding her origins. Sorry, how is the city? He chuckled. Well, things are pretty good. Us ghouls aren't treated very well, but that pretty much is common no matter where we go. And yeah, still a mega spell knocked into uh, the salt cube. That hasn't been going off yet. He chuckled, and Lexi smiled a little awkwardly, happy he didn't seem to catch on to her awkward attempts to hide the fact that she was from the past. They shared a moment of silence before the doors up above the catwalk opened, and Oso ducked through the doorway and exited the small room. There was another few awkward moments as Oso struggled to come back down. His side made the trip a little more than difficult. And if he took to the skies, he would have simply created so much wind that every pony present would have been holding down their paperwork and even their computers. You're asking a lot, Oso. A whole lot. But no pony ever said the path forward would bring an easy path. The unicorn ghoul following Oso out seemed a bit distressed. Sandbox, what did they bring? Sandbox stood upright and smiled. It's some really good stuff. I could really put it to good use. The unicorn ghoul grumbled and he paused for a moment. His eyes seemed to float gently across the room. He was very unsure. Then something clicked. I think I know. Look, I'm not going to pretend that any of our little group has any love for each other. And one such repaired artifact needed for the project. He paused, looking to Oso, who scowled knowingly. Yes, that artifact. We're going to need it eventually. And I don't want to send two dozen of my ghouls only to get three back, if any. Retrieve it, bring it back, and we'll not only put up with the flea bags, but we'll even work with that insufferable ass tyrant. That's a pretty big undertaking. I'll look it over, but we don't even know where it is. Oso's low grumbling voice almost sounded like he was losing patience as he could not afford to. The unicorn grumbled and grinned from a leathery decaying ear to leathery decayed ear. Its last known location was the Crystal Empire. 
Oso's eye twitched angrily. The Empire is gone now. No pony has seen it since the bombs dropped. And its physical location, if it still exists, is a frozen wasteland that I can't survive. You're asking the impossible. Our goal is impossibility itself. And you know full well that we need that scroll. We aren't going to get very far without it. And after the last time, I'm pretty sure you owe us big. Some pony has to make the trip. Has to do the mission. You're the only ones with your super soldier. Oh, so much better than ponies, non-coward griffins. His grin started to scare Lexi. But the more she thought about it, she would likely be the same if she got such a massive advantage on some pony who had angered her as much as Tyrant appeared to have angered this one unicorn. Also answered through her beak clenched in anger. I'll speak to the others. Come now, ponies. We have an old griffin to piss off to a degree never before seen. Lexi let out a soft eep at the massive talons nearly scooping her and her armor up and pushing through the door. Hearing the remark on Tyron, she wasn't quite sure she wanted to go back, even if it meant staying with the rotten ghouls. Sandbox, get that gear packed up for distribution and use, and then help our friends out. Then I want those damn turrets back up and working before sundown. And I want them armored. The unicorn disappeared back at the catwalks into his office. Sandbox groaned, but at least he had already prepared the parts. Come on. And I know I don't have to say it, but oh, sorry. Old Artie is still bent out of shape from Tyron's last visit. Look, that trip is close to impossible. Just come back next year, or at least when summer is going on. Then maybe Arctic Star won't be as angry, and we can make a joint effort. A year or so does wonders in calming ponies down. Oso sighed loudly. Yeah, but you still have no idea how long Tyron holds his grudges. I might have to leave Lexi and Kroth outside for a bit when Tyron throws his tantrum. It's damned impossible to get anywhere the Empire was. Perhaps not impossible to get in, if you have Tyron on your side. But even I would die on that trek. It's not impossible. Oso and all ponies present turned to look at Kroos, who was looking a little uncertain at first. But then upon closer inspection, he looked very uncomfortable. It's not impossible. I know a guy. A guy who's done it before. And so long as we pay, he'll take us there and help us survive. Is he expensive? Osa's voice almost sounded relieved, but the look on Kroos's face was just a little too uncomfortable to ignore. Even Fobwatch looked in. He might not have been welcome, but for now he was part of the group, and his curiosity had been piqued as well. Kroos broke eye contact, almost as if he really did not want to talk about it, but with a sharp sigh he looked back and answered firmly. Uh, a little, but he's, well, he's more the problem than the price. Footnote, no level achieved.